something different. So one, each one of us will introduce ourselves and also tell you a fun fact about us. So um, we'll start with Vera. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Vera Shokina. I'm a managing director with Silicon Valley Bank. Um, I cover international markets for the bank, uh, work with uh, venture capital funds around the world and with the technology companies that develop on venture capital model that raise financing and uh, target global markets. Um, Turkey is one of the countries that I come, try to come every year and have a lot of clients, both as funds and as technology companies. The fun fact about me is back 20 years ago, there was um, world uh, championship in track and field in Russia, and I presented the gold medal to Carl Lewis, who won the 100 meters uh, race. Oh, awesome, yeah. Did you get to give him a hug? Uh, no, he was on the <laughs> pedestal. <Okay. laughs> All right, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Sinal Yenal uh, I'm responsible for the operations for AWS uh, here in Turkey, and uh, I'm, uh, I have been with Amazon Web Services for the last uh, six years. Uh, previously, I was responsible for the financial services technology. Before that, I was a consultant for financial services for a very long time. And yes, I worked in Turkey and uh, until year 2000, so 15 years after a US brief US experience, I'm back in Turkey. Um, a fun fact. Uh, I was actually one of the few guys who worked in building the internet backbone here in Turkey. Uh, probably many of you don't remember it. That's the national backbone was named Turnet. And I was the first guy to hit the enter button, the first surfing on the national backbone. My, uh, my, my friend was configuring the routers at Turkish Telecom and I said, you know, it's ready, it's working. And I hit the enter button, netscape.net. I don't know if you remember, I downloaded the first thing in the national backbone. If you wonder, it was a two megabits per second connection for the whole country. <coughs> now it's a whole different infrastructure today. Awesome. How many of you remember what Netscape was? <laughs> okay, so that's quite a few. All right, awesome. Yusuf? Well, I mean, um, I was, uh, so it's 1972 and it's in Beirut and uh, the whole family and everybody is, is celebrating New Year's Eve and I decided to get born. So. That's when I get born. I was born on the 1st of January, 1972, during a party. <laughs> okay, uh, so you ruined the party then? No, I mean, I uh, ended up basically, you know, breaking up the party, but uh, okay. uh, uh, I was a, it was a nice moment, as they say, so. So I'm sure your mom kind of holds you up to that and you have to throw a lot of parties for her, or? I mean, it's something that I can't forget, right? It's every New Year's Eve, basically, I have to remember that I was born, Annie, so it's difficult even to surprise you me. You have big birthday parties. Every part of the world celebrates my yeah. birthday party. Great. So what do you do? Um, I, I more or less focus on uh, building up ecosystems for uh, entrepreneurship and, and, and innovation. And um, I've been doing that um, out of Jordan and Amman. Uh, predominantly, uh, um, there are two main focuses. On one side, it's uh, getting up accelerators, uh, thematic accelerators that can de deliver seed stage companies um, for investment purposes. And on the other side, I, I, I work with uh, uh, in, um, um, Asad Jamjum and some others on um, investing into startups. So we make different investments that we'll talk about today even. Okay, awesome. So fun fact about me, I have a very weird relationship with languages. So I speak or read or write about seven of them, but there is one language that I understand and can speak, but cannot read or write. And there is one language that I can write perfectly well, read perfectly well, but I can't understand it at all. So I know that's very, very random. And so yeah, that's the fun fact. What are the languages? Oh, so <laughs> it's one of them is Arabic. So I grew up in Pakistan, so I can actually read Arabic and I can write Arabic because it's the same transcript as Urdu, but I can't understand what I'm saying or reading. <laughs> and Hindi is essentially the same, um, like it's essentially the same language as Urdu, but the transcript is different. So I can't write or read it, but I can speak and understand it perfectly. So it's kind of weird, but that kind of goes on to French and Spanish, which I can understand and not write, so it's weird. Anyways, so we'll start with one of the first, so kind of the first thing I want to touch upon is why do people think big, Corporates can't innovate. 
So what is keeping big corporations from innovating? And I feel like Yusuf's ready to answer that question. I mean, I mean, corporations are innovating. I think it's the level of innovation that we want to measure them by. Mm -hmm. And one key element that you know, doesn't serve their purpose, and it's always a challenging debate within corporations, is how do you reward innovation from employees um, who end up basically creating these really bright and fantastic ideas that don't et end up rewarding them financially. So there's no equity, there's no wealth distribution, so I'm not gonna get richer by coming up with a great idea for you know, Procter & Gamble or if I'm working in, in General Electric, for, some, for, for example. I'm not gonna own the intellectual property. It's gonna be owned by the corporate that I live with. So I think that's, that's the, 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 they do innovate, but I think it's the nature of the innovation that we want to understand and address, and, and I think that's where the debate uh, uh, is always you know, happening and continuing, and I think there isn't a really a, a solid answer about, about wh wh what they should do and where they should take this forward. So in your opinion, where should they take it? Well, I, I mean, it depends on the appetite of, of, of these uh, corporations. Now, the, um, it, in, 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 in an actual exercise we did with the Royal Jordanian, for example, we had a, uh, the biggest debate was not with the uh, corporate team or the, with the IT team or with the value chain across the airline was with human resources. So, um, um, and they were saying, okay, if we invited our employee base to innovate, um, we are in essence basically giving them the opportunity to depart from these corporations. So we've invested into these individuals tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases. So how do we basically um, uh, recuperate that investment when we allow them to walk away from the corporate and from the business? I think that they should in, in invite entities to do that. They should invite people actually to create companies um, um, under their portfolio in a way, and they should become their own venture or VC um, um, uh, first investor in these ideas. Cool, awesome. So for somebody who actually works at a big corporate. <laughs> well, I mean, big corporate, of course, yeah, Amazon would be the fourth largest company in the world, but we feel different. I mean, you, you, hopefully you feel the same way. Every, every day we go to work, it's day one for us. The word day one means a lot of things for us. We go to work as it's our day one. We act like it's day one. We are thinking about new things, how we can innovate, how, how can we build new things. I mean, internally, uh, even externally, we have a building called day one and all those kind of things. So it's important to understand what day two means for us. And day two in, uh, in a recent shareholder letter by Jeff Bezos is very interesting. I, I've read it and you can read it on, uh, on the internet says, what does day two mean for a company, a very large corporate company? It means stasis, it means irrelevance, it means decline, and it suddenly means death. So the decline may take years, but eventually day two is not where we want to be. We want to be an innovative company, and we believe we are. And that the way we do that is actually we believe we sh every day we should go to work, every single Amazon AWS employee, we, we, we believe it's day one for us. Uh, I can give more examples, by the way. Yeah. Sure, sure. Claire. Yeah, <clears throat> so I think uh, to answer the question why the big companies have struggled innovating, uh, I think it's the answer is always in people. Uh, so frequently we see the large companies having the same people in charge uh, of innovation agenda as in charge of the, uh, you know, getting to the sales goals, to getting overall performance. Uh, and that can be like CEO or some other people like senior management, you know, uh, your large corporations, I think they always have the, uh, uh, you know, short-term goals, they need to get the quarterly revenues, they need to sell the products, they have big customers. So the, the innovation, uh, it takes, you know, a lot of dedication, a lot of time, a lot of, you know, financing, so you need to have a separate team, uh, you know, driving the, the, you know, the innovative decisions, the innovative products. At the same time, the uh, people who are in charge, the executive management, I think they need to be uh, uh, in charge of supporting uh, the innovation and it should be on the annual goals to implement the, the innovative decisions. I think the best example where the company, or one of the best examples, you know, not to mention, uh, where, where it you know, works really well is Intel, right? So they have this separate group, Intel Capital. Uh, this is the group that funds innovation. Um, it's it's you know, well-funded. They have, uh, you know, everybody knows about them. They have one of the best, uh, most successful innovative portfolio. The way they work is that they have independent people running the uh, 
you know, the fund, uh, and they have, um, they, they also need to have a sponsor within Intel. So each, you know, innovative decision and financing is taken uh, both by the financial people who are driven by financial performance, who evaluate the market, evaluate the product, uh, see, uh, you know, whether Intel will implement the solution or not. You know, they, they take the solid venture decisions. At the same time, they do need to have a sponsor within the Intel uh, corporation, which confirms that that's a valuable product that it fits with their, uh, you know, you know, with 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 their you know corporate goals, and that works really well when you separate. Uh, the decisions about the future of the company, about the products, uh, from the innovation new products that come to the market. Right, yeah, that's an, another like great way to understand like how innovation works or where the problem is the reality gap itself, right? So if you think of life or every like spectrum as an X and a Y axis, then corporations or even humans were on this very lean path, right? So for example, we go to college, we get married, we have kids, we lead a certain life, and as you're growing, your stakeholders are growing. Similarly, if you look at a company, you start, you start adding more stakeholders, you start adding more products, more customers, your stakeholders and your responsibility is growing on this lean, kind of like a hockey stick, but it's a straight line. Whereas, if you look at innovation or technology, Technology is like a U, like a gigantic U curve. So technology is going all the way here and you have like, oh, this microphone is not helping with my X and Y. So it's like here and then technology is kind of like here and everything you have here is that reality gap. So what is technologically possible today is way ahead of the curve of what we're working on both as entrepreneurs, humans or corporates. And the higher you're on that curve, the more riskier it is, but the more you're going to change lives. And essentially, that's kind of hard when you have a whole bunch of stakeholders. So, I mean, that's just kind of... Well, I mean, I'd like to add, I mean, just to consider the audience here, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, innovation is expensive. Right. Okay, so the, the um, I think we need to understand that if you look, it, probably people in, in, in the audience and all of us around the table would be either students on campuses or their employees within their own um, 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 profession. They're considering, or you know, founders in startups. So, when when you want to access uh, um, uh, uh, grants for the purpose of covering the cost of an expensive exercise you want to do from that you want to innovate in, that's expensive. Okay. So, in general, when we ask ourselves, so if we can bring it down and talk about our region, and probably one of the reasons where we have high capital, high investments, we have oil-based economies, and and if you look at the amount of financial output we do. We are mesmerizing the world in some cases when it comes to real estate, but we're really not doing any, 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 any fun things when it comes to anything else. We don't have R&D centers, which is a very important differentiation between us and others. They don't, therefore, the state is not shouldering with the private sector or with corporations the cost of innovation. And you know, students struggle to cover their own expenses when they come up with a very nice idea. The, I think of, and I would also want to highlight that innovation is not tech only. I mean, so, you know, we're not seeing people talking about uh, regulation and innovative regulations. Who's talking with the municipality today to say, yes, I, I will allow tomorrow driveless cars to, you know, run around our, our streets. That's a regulation, right? So that's, that's an innovative aspect that doesn't also allow corporations to, to innovate because the regulation is very uh, uh, stuck in, where it, in, in, in the time it is in. And, and cannot progress with these corporates. So, so you end up with a corporate that's family business or you know, probably maybe traded on the stock exchange, but net-net, they cannot afford to innovate, in, in, in our region at least. It's very expensive for them to do so. They find uh, um, government a, a major stagnation for innovation, and uh, you know, they end up basically doing what I would call product innovation. You know, they incrementally develop whatever they have to you know, grow their market share and develop themselves further and further. But, we shouldn't put the you know the the whole um, um, uh, shoulder of the responsibility on them alone, but I think it's a it's a holistic element where you know government, campuses, and universities, the private sector, society in general needs to come together and say we want to be an innovative economy, an innovative state in a way. Right, and to your point in R and D, you know, as Amazon invests a lot in R and D, but in your experience, who's so if we were to innovate as corporates or as you were saying as entire ecosystems. Whose responsibility it is to fund this R&D? Well, uh, it is uh, like, it's not like a responsibility. I mean, first of all, mm -hmm. it's not like, oh, I, I've seen in so, uh, I worked in so many different corporates. Uh, I was 
almost every single large bank in US, uh, investment banks, hedge funds, the stock exchanges. And they were all talking about innovation. Here in Turkey, also, we visit almost every shop. And when they speak about innovation, it's about a new room, different furniture. Always you can paint on the wall and bean bags maybe. And that's the innovation. Well, it's not the funding, it's not the buying furniture or uh, having a new department as innovation. I think it should be with the culture. We are a culture-based company. We really believe the culture of the operations, regardless of big or small. I mean, as, as a base, in 2010, we brought 60, around 60 features, new features on AWS, Amazon Web Services platform. In 2014, it was 514, and in 2016, it was 1,017. And this year, until September, it's around uh, 928. Over 3,800 new features that we developed in, within 10 years. And this year, it will be over 1,000. So <clears throat> how do we do it is the key question, I believe, because it's like, I don't think it's a size issue. It's because we have deeper funding or something. It's, I think, but it the, is in some yeah. ways. I mean, we can't yeah. neglect that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you have cash, you can fund. If you don't, well, but we don't have cash. That's why we don't. We don't innovate. Is not the answer as well. True. Because you know all the companies, including Amazon, we didn't start as Amazon, right? But we are. If you read uh, like the Amazon shareholder letters, it's still in '97. Still, we go with it. It's one of the things we don't change the our vision and mission, and. What's happening is like what we believe at least our, we are also looking into uh, like a reflection, like why is it happening? The first thing is that uh, innovation is in our DNA and we hire the builders. Not like the technology companies hiring certain things, we want people to build things. Like building things from the scratch is a different responsibility. It's a, Launching a product is not the end of the day. This is very important. Many people, especially in large corporations, they believe you have written the code, there's a working product, you're done. Well, that's only day one. That's when it starts. Our developers, our builders actually work that way. The second thing that we believe in is that we believe in decentralized uh, autonomous teams working independently. Somebody mentioned like the pizza teams, two pizza teams. And we do not relate to other companies, other uh, drivers. These small decentralized teams, very much like your startup, work directly with the customers, try to understand what the customers say. No product on earth was delivered in one day and it was perfect, it was a success out of the box. Look at every f successful startup. They had iterations, they have iterations, iterations, collecting the feedback, getting better. So that's what we do. Every time we collect the data, we do the iteration, we understand more, we talk to customers more. The customer connection is the key because you don't understand your customers, you're a little bit irrelevant. And the third thing, like anything else, uh, we, work, we use the same building blocks that built AWS, small reusable pieces that we can use after and after and that actually fosters the innovation. Well, will it work for everyone? Again, this is, this is a transition age. The culture, the innovative culture of the large corporations is under attack in every direction, and I believe there will be changes uh, soon. Just to build on the second point about decentralized autonomous teams, uh, in Silicon Valley, I'm based in Silicon Valley, and we work a lot with uh, corporate venture capital firms. Uh, usually those are the ones who are responsible for innovations frequently and bringing the innovative technology into the large corporates around the world. And we see pretty much every large telecom operator around the world open an office in Silicon Valley. Every automobile company open an office in Silicon Valley. And uh, you know they all have uh, budgets to invest into innovative technologies, so they have access to technology, they have access to the management, and they would like to uh, incorporate si some of the elements you know, with the idea that sometimes M&A can uh, happen as well. Uh, what those uh, corporate VCs are telling you know, when we discuss things with them, you know, what's the best practice, what, the, uh, you know, what doesn't work, is uh, it doesn't work to put a person in Silicon Valley uh, and then all the decisions to be taken back 
in uh, Korea or in Europe, um, you, it's not competitive. In Silicon Valley, things are happening very fast. Uh, everybody is empowered to take you know, quick decisions on the investments. So if the large corporate you know, from Korea or Japan, uh, for example, right, uh, comes and say, oh, we like this technology. Let us think if we should make an investment. And then it takes a week for the person on the ground to write the memo, and then you know, he sends it back to his country. It takes like two weeks to get it on the agenda. By the time it gets discussed, the company already funded and you know, maybe even met some of the milestones. So this doesn't work. But you know, to your point, when you put the empowered team, for example, in Silicon Valley, that can quickly evaluate the technology. Uh, and you know, still they need to connect to the key people in, in the large corporations. And that you know, stands for American companies as well. And they can quickly make the decisions about uh, implementing technology as a client or as investment. Then it works much better and the results are clear you know, much, much faster. Actually, what you described is a very negative trend we are also observing. I heard a term from the, uh, some of my friends. They call it the startup petting. Mm -hmm. like, it's like a petting zoo trip. Like you, you, you have your like, executives, and they say, okay, we're going to Silicon Valley. And then you take all the executives in a large corporate, and you organize a massive trip, and you visit, definitely mm -hmm. visit Google, Facebook, Amazon, and a few successful unicorns, yeah. right? And then it's called the startup petting. Uh, Tour, petting. Right? Yeah. So you go, oh, what a cute startup. Lovely things you're doing. We would love to do the same. And you just tour the whole thing. It's a good trip. You see all the startups. And you come back to your office, wherever in Istanbul or like in the region, and say, OK, guys, we are starting this innovation thing. Let's order, order the new furniture. So it's <laughs> no, I hear you on that. So I obviously work in Silicon Valley. And we work with a lot of corporates. And I think I get five emails a week which kind of say, oh, we're coming to Silicon Valley. Can you help us meet Elon Musk? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you and me both, bro. <laughs> and that's just not how it works. But to your point about innovation being expensive and how decentralization can help, I think there's also something key that's missing there is the way we think and solve problems, right? Because if your premise is that this is a very expensive problem to solve, or we need everything new, like furniture and offices and everything, if we're going to innovate, that's not how it works. And that's kind of where startups have a huge advantage. So to give you guys an example, one of my favorite startups is this company from Pakistan. And um, what they did is they essentially make a Fitbit for cows. So they kind of hacked a whole bunch of, just like bought a whole bunch of stuff from AliExpress or Alibaba, put these things together, and it's a Fitbit, just, just like a cow collar. It's actually called, the company's called Cowler. It went to YC, and um, they kind of hacked it together, and now their biggest client is Engro and a lot of other companies within, um, in the US, in the, uh, in the farming market in the US. And, the qu and that is a very interesting example. And same way for autonomous vehicles and all these things happening, these are op tremendous opportunities for students or entrepreneurs in the audience for them to figure these things out because they're very, very lean. And they can think about problems differently and then that's kind of where corporates become their clients. Well, I mean, there, there, there are other areas. Where, I mean, we've had interesting experiences where, uh, in, in some cases, creating these relationships between problem solvers and between people who own the expenditure. So, okay, in certain cases, we don't have the R&D centers. We don't have the people that are, you know, spitting out some interesting solutions. Like you, you gave an example, there are people sitting in a, in, in the back office in, in, in a room in, in their own house, yeah, so and they're solving a problem. Uh -huh. So why do you need an R&D center? I mean, a pie, like a, like a small chip costs maybe... $10 or something, right? So you can actually hack things at home. And like with CRISPR, you can actually even edit DNA at home. So why do you need R&D centers to innovate? Well, I mean, we, we, we need to look at, when, when I look at innovation, I look at the whole innovation value chain for a country level. And, 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 and that's where you want to try to address issues and you see where is the expenditure coming. Now, yes, there are areas where innovation can be, um, let, let me call it at a very shallow level where where uh, you know, somebody with a laptop can basically start to do something and solve a problem. But then you enter into, uh, into certain areas and situations where you need more computing power. So um, you, know, you need supercomputers. You need basically uh, capacities to do to and develop complicated algorithms that require certain science behind it. So it's, 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 um, um, in, in, if you look at some of the 
uh, advancements that you have in iPhones, okay? It's m a, m a great deal of that is funded indirectly by DARPA, okay? So, so there are state institutions and state organizations, you look at the Israeli example of how they have funded and still do fund um, um, innovation in a very large scale, which basically makes it much, much easier for people to pick up and hack and, and do some growth hacking themselves and, and make it cheaper for them to, to, to deliver a specific solution. So one example that we basically had an interesting discussion with was Cisco. Cisco came in to do a certain project, certain real estate project in Mecca. It was the largest built-up area in the world then, okay? And Cisco was going to identify, and this is a lost opportunity, but this is an example. We were going to spend around a, a billion dollars for each tower, so that's seven billion US dollars. And Cisco created, from scratch, new intellectual property to address the size of this monument project. We walked away with zero ownership of that IP, so we didn't even use or, or leverage as a corporate, as an entity that was responsible for that project, the opportunity of not only working with a, you know, cement and concrete, but walking away with some innovation that is now co-owned or owned by Cisco and the entity that basically funded and paid them for that. So, so I think it's a mindset also about how do you want to innovate, but I, but I do believe that centers are important for corporations and startups to basically find it easier to do so. Right, so Vera, where are these opportunities for, I know I keep saying your name slightly wrong. I'm sorry about that. Okay. No. <laughs> All right, so where are these opportunities for corporates and startups or corporates and these entrepreneurial ecosystems to work together? Well, as a start, I think all the major corporations need to support early stage entrepreneurs. I think it's, you know, when, when there is a good investment climate, when there is a lot of new small businesses coming, I think the whole, uh, you know, ecosystem benefits. And, you know, if you're in a position to support uh, the startups, the uh, your innovation in any way, whether it's through mentorship, whether it's through finding of some important events that helps entrepreneurs come together and connect with the corporates, uh, whether it's uh, you know pitches, uh, you know whatever you can give back to ecosystem. I think for large corporates, it's the right thing to do. That's number one. Uh, second, uh, again, an SVB, uh, you know, we're a bank. Yeah, and you know, it's you know, in bank, it's not very easy to innovate, right? There are regulations, there are customers, there are expectations. Uh, the the risks of doing something wrong with an innovative product uh, that can disrupt the uh, you know steady operations is very high. So we created the uh, um, acceleration program in partnership with Mastercard and then with the first data um, that um, where we pick up the most interesting innovative companies, um, it's, it's not a lot. It's about five companies we pick up every six months, and we help them with the whole power of organization through the network, uh, trying to help with them to integrate their products. So we're, we're just putting this out there uh, you know, for the benefit of the uh, companies. And it was actually very productive. A lot of companies, after the acceleration programs, they closed the funding. We acquired, we, net, we, we liked one company so much that we acquired it for the benefit of the bank. So that's another way to do this. Uh, and then, uh, um, you know, thirdly, I think, you know, um, just having the right goals for, for the groups to work together to make sure the innovation is implemented, like, like in Amazon, like in Intel Capital, I think it's, it's, it's very important. Right, so where are these opportunities with Amazon, for example? Yeah, definitely, we, uh, you may have noticed lately we've been sharing more and more our experience, what we believe made us uh, in a better place compared with other companies, which is our culture, how we work, how we operate. And every platform we are trying to explain, like the world is changing. For example, with AWS, we decoupled the requirement for the hardware, which is a big like a blocker in many of the new startups. And uh, we see if you're a new company, if you, are, you have great ideas, there are a lot of blockers. So uh, we have several programs, like many other large companies, like uh, we have an activate program for startups where we actually fund a lot of startups, at least easing the cost of infrastructure requirements. But it's not just that. Again, what I believe is what we learn, because we have the chance to hire the best architects, you know, like a lot of engineers. So, for example, what we are doing in Menestis and soon in Istanbul is like uh, we have office days. So, startups come in and we we just listen to them and just, you know, giving our advice if it's worth something. Like, if you build this infrastructure using A and B and C, that looks like a more scalable, reliable, or if you have a compliance problem, which many of the startups are having issues in meeting a gazillion different compliances, uh, we can say, okay, th these are the ways you can address these compliance problems with the office hours. 
So these are just may seem very small, but again, for uh, for startups or for the rest of the world, we believe this is what believe uh, uh, bringing success. The more important thing is like in the production world because I always tell startups, don't think like, okay, 10 people will use your product. You will scale, the super scale. When it comes that day, how will you address that thing? So we are talking about how you can build scalable infrastructure, how you can build secure infrastructure. And again, that's almost uh, sharing our know-how. And so far, we believe it's working. Anis, if you primarily work with governments and these ecosystem builders, so where are these opportunities that you think um, people in this room can fill gaps in? Well, I mean, the, the, um, the, there's a term that we keep using, at least in, in, in our discussions with different people, is how can we create what we call open lab environments? Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, how can a hospital become an open lab for early, early adoption, testing, validating? So how can you reach out to you know, a community like this and tell them, my doors are open. If you have certain ideas that I can experiment with and use, you can come over, stay in the cafe of the hospital, for example, and, 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 and have a dialogue, have a discussion, talk with some nurses. We can do some you know, wor workshop with nurses, workshop with different physicians to understand exactly where we can take things forward and how we can take things forward. So that environment where we're trying to advocate with uh, the private sector, which, which is in our part of the world predominantly owned by family businesses. Um, um, you know, large conglomerates that are now still rooted in family operational aspects and so forth. So, and introduce them to think in a manner that's a bit more disruptive and, and more inviting for people to come and think about things and reminding the founders of these family businesses that's how you, that, you know, that's how you began. I mean, that's, you basically were an entrepreneur at one point in time and you did things in a, in a, in a different way. On the government side, it's really, again, introducing their, uh, opening up their expenditure a little bit where they would basically, before they bring in the big boys to come and buy their, their services and, and you know if you know you're going to do this project two years down the road or three years down the road why don't you invite the ecosystem and come and tell them okay who can who can compete with Cisco who can come up with a solution that can basically provide us with the following requirements and you know out and, and we'll buy the service from you right we'll we will not basically buy from Cisco and and the same thing goes for open source you know why should I go and buy from Microsoft for example or and and then you go down into you know this, the, the simplest of things um, metering systems and urban design projects um, so it's really about, about the government coming out and saying, we will be on the side of innovation, entrepreneurs, founders, and, and, and we will also be biased towards corporates who do that. And I think that, that combination uh, between both becomes what I call, um, you, know, you, you can then shift mountains. I mean, this session, and these events, and many other like them across the region are a grassroots movement. We're, 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 we're not supported heavily by big, you know, big government uh, um, uh, backing and funding and support. So how can we you know, bring up the discussion to make them part of this grassroots movement? Yeah. No, that's, that's great, I agree. Every single stakeholder in the ecosystem needs to mobilize <coughs> to make this innovation and this change happen. So we're gonna end on a slightly different note. So you know how people always say, well, what are your parting thoughts? Um, you can give us your parting thoughts, but I also want each one of you to tell the audience that if, what is the one thing that you can help them with? Or what is the one thing that they can reach out to you at any point in time for help with? So we'll, where do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, well, you know, as the U.S. bank would try to find opportunities for us, for, for entrepreneurs to be able to sell in the U.S. market. So if you are a VC-backed company um, and you generate revenues uh, in the U.S. and need U.S. bank account, obviously, you know, we can be helpful. That's what we do every day, and that's why our job is in the international market is to enable the entrepreneurs to sell in American markets and uh, be able to facilitate those transactions. Uh, on a personal note, um, if you are trying to sell to uh, U.S. cooperation, I'm definitely a resource to help through the stages. I think uh, it's very, very important for the entrepreneur, if you're interested to sell your solution uh, to a large corporation, really understand uh, you know, the, the, the various phases of the decision making within the corporation, understand you know, who are the sponsors, who would be the drivers 
for your innovative solution within the company, and it's a long process. So whenever you try to establish partnership, sell your product to a large corporation, prepare for a long-term, build relationship for long-term, and uh, this will work out at the end. You just need to understand how to sell to this company, how to uh, walk through implementation, how potentially, uh, you know, this, th this, all these conversations can result in M&A. So you just need to you understand the process and be patient and think for long term. Uh, we are expanding, you may have noticed, uh, uh, locally in your geography. So uh, right now we have customers in 190 countries and we have, uh, we operate in 16 geographies, six more coming up. We just a few weeks ago announced Bahrain region. In every region we build multiple data center zones. Uh, Currently, it was around 43 last time I counted. So we are local. Uh, like, uh, if, if I want to give an example from Turkey, uh, we, we have been operating since 2015 in Istanbul. So our teams are local. We would like to talk to you. We are not, uh, you know, we, we understand the limited resources all the startups are going through, and we would like to understand your business and share our own experiences. And uh, as long as we have the, we have a lot of like meetups and uh, the different events like this. So it's, we are approachable. What, where we can help is not only giving you credits and like startup uh, credits, we actually want to share our experience. We want to understand what is missing because we are a customer obsessed company and you are, uh, we will, unless we understand you, we don't think we have a space in this business. So again, my point is that we are local, not anymore like a, a console on the internet and you just write something. So I encourage everyone to talk to, uh, talk to their local AWS uh, teams. It, it will help a lot. Thank you. Well, I mean, our region, I guess, is, it's, it's, it's a bad way to start it, but it, I guess our region is full of problems. Okay, so. Um, we have a major rebuilding effort that's going to happen in the next couple of years. And I think in, in that there's an opportunity. So if, and I hope we don't rebuild anything using, you know, whatever was done yesterday. So I think we should leapfrog in many ways. But so saying that, if, if anybody's working on a specific solution or solving a specific problem, and you're looking for a validating partner, you know, whether it's a hospital, whether it's a, you know, a, a government institution, a corporate, a company, an entity, that you believe this specific organization can become an, 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 a validation partner, as I call it, or an early adopter that can test your product. You're not asking for any investment or funding. You're just trying to find someone that can help you validate what you claim to be a solution to a specific problem. Reach out, and I'll try to basically put you up with the right individuals and see how that can probably give you a contribution towards you know, delivering on those milestones that you want to have and the KPIs that you're working against. Awesome, thank you so much. Well, I can help you meet Elon Musk. Oh, actually, no, <laughs> I can't. But if you guys are, a lot of times innovation is just about thinking problems differently. And if you really have an innovative solution to a problem, reach out to all of these people, reach out to me, we will be more than happy to help you. And think about things. Don't, like, never stop thinking and questioning things, and one of these days you will end up innovating on the problems that we face. And the more problems we have, the more opportunities they are in the market. So uh, my email is asra, that's A-S-R-A at draperuniversity.com. So if you have any questions, any pitch decks you want me to review, or any product that I can help you with, please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much to our amazing panelists for all of your insight into innovation and corporates, and I hope we're all a part of building a better world. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you all. You.